This week, I'll continue discussing the age of absolutism with the rise of Russia and its vast empire. From the Middle Ages, Russia emerged as a powerful Eurasian state ruled by absolutist dynasties such as the Rurik and Romanov royal families. Famous such monarchs included Ivan IV, known as the Terrible, Peter the Great, who began his modernization of Russia, along with Catherine the Great, and also emperors such as Alexander I, who defeated Napoleon. Russia's growth as an empire spread from the Ukraine all the way from Western Russia to the shores of the Pacific Ocean. This occurred pretty much between the 16th and 19th centuries. Russia eventually became one of the largest nations in the world. Today, the Russian Federation is marred in controversy, especially due to the ongoing conflicts with Ukraine with the Russian-Ukrainian War. This conflict, along with other past historical events, such as the Russian Revolution, World War II, the Cold War era, are certainly to influence Russia's future. This lecture starts now. Of course, we're a little Russian uh, national anthem, of course. And all those the famous, you know, pictures, of course, in Russia, of course, we'll talk about today. So you know, welcome you back, Daniel Simon at Baton Rouge Community College. Hope everybody's having a great week, week six, of course, of this history, 11-23 class. So all right, all right, all right, everybody's having a great week overall. So uh, anyway, uh, kind of continue this week uh, with the age of absolutism. Uh, of course, I'll wrap that up today. Uh, talking about the rise of Russia, especially the Russian Empire, uh, is primarily what we'll kind of get into today. Uh, but um, anyway, um, I'll talk about, of course, uh, some of our ma uh, major announcements that I have right now uh, that are kind of important uh, overall. I'll kind of talk about that first, and I'll kind of get to some of the students that are watching live uh, right now. But I do have some new announcements today, of course, to talk about uh, that are, of course, important about the class. Uh, of course, we know we still have that Reformation quiz up, which will probably be up for maybe a few more days. I think I'll leave it open for a couple of days uh, more. We need to wrap up. But um, the main thing, of course, this week I'll, of course, have for you, uh, you know, assignment-wise is the first exam, uh, of course, which is going to be on the age of absolutism, uh, which is on those four lectures, of course, on Bourbon, Bourbon France, the Habsburgs, uh, the rise of Prussia, of course, in Russia uh, today as well. Uh, so that's going to be our major assessment, of course, for the semester right now. And I will have next week, uh, I think it's on Monday, I'll have a uh, recorded lecture. I'll have uh, on the, uh, I think it's on the uh, Scientific Revolution and Age of Enlightenment. I'm not going to have a, a live lecture Monday because uh, I am kind of going out of town uh, this weekend. So uh, I'll kind of announce that later, I think on Sunday, Monday, later on. So I'll kind of, I'll send an email about that particular assignment. Uh, but uh, no live lecture planned, of course, for Monday coming up. Uh, I know next week in week seven, I'll, I'll be moving on to talk about the rise of the British Empire uh, also as well. Uh, looks like we've got a few students watching uh, live right now. I know uh, Lulu. Hey, good morning. I uh, hope you're having a good morning overall uh, today. Uh, Brittany's also watching as well. Uh, good morning also. And then Ashland's watching. And then along with also, we've got Christopher watching right now. So if you want to join us now, 
of course you can. <clears throat> you can also, of course, watch it later, uh, of course, recording as well. Uh, of course, uh, today uh, I'm going to talk about primarily the rise of Russia. I'll kind of talk about, you know, mostly going to talk about the Romanov dynasty, but I'll kind of will go back uh, and talk about the history of Russia because Russia does start a long time ago. It starts, of course, in the Middle Ages, uh, which is true about that. Uh, but I'll kind of talk about the emergence of the Rurik and the Romanov dynasties. Uh, and the Romanov dynasty is the one that kind of puts them on a footing to becoming an empire, which, you know, Ru the Russian empire peaked kind of between the 19th and the 20th centuries. So I'll kind of get to that today and talk a lot about Russian history, because I guess it's kind of controversial now because of all the conflicts between Russia and Ukraine and the West uh, that we kind of see in the news and all that. Uh, so if you have any comments, questions, of course, in the live stream, you know, let me know. Uh, of course, you can always leave me comments. Uh, later on my channel, or uh, you can also subscribe to my channel uh, below uh, also uh, as well. So uh, anyway, uh, I'll kind of go back in history and we'll, we'll kind of first talk about a little background about, you know, the rise of Russia overall. Uh, of course, when people think of Russia, uh, they think of the czars, the czars of Russia, uh, like Peter the Great, uh, who you see, uh, of course, in that image. Uh, sometimes you, you think about the double-headed eagle, which, you know, is a common symbol, of course, of, of Russia, still kind of used in Russia today, uh, although it's kind of more of a symbol of the czars and the Romanov dynasty from a long time ago. Uh, Russia as a state, uh, like I said, started in the Middle Ages. I think the theory about when Russia started was around the 10th century, mid to about the late uh, 900s is about right. Uh, they think the actual date, maybe, of when Russia was founded is about the year 962, uh, which is about 1,160 years ago to today, like in this year, 2022. Uh, although the early Russian state uh, was often called the Kievan Rus, or Kievan Rus uh, was the common name they used. And uh, Russia, uh, the people of Russia today are kind of a mix of peoples, mostly European and other, other peoples that populate Russia uh, later. But I'll kind of get to it later. But predominantly, the people that settle Russia were a combination of uh, Viking people and then people that are also Slavic in origin uh, as well. I think I've got some uh, other images of Russia right here. Uh, I'll talk about St. Basil's. Uh, cathedral uh, that was built later by Ivan the Fourth, the Terrible. But I kind of showed you some early images of Russia. That's kind of considered one of the most famous images of Russia you'll sometimes see is the colorful onion domes of, of course, Saint Basil's. Uh, but Russian absolutism, um, they think it started. You know, we go back to a long time ago. The Vikings first came in. Uh, like I said. Uh, in the Middle Age, the Vikings who were up in, you know, like Sweden and other states uh, in Scandinavia were curious about that part of the world, like Russia, and they were hoping to link up with a lot of the trade routes uh, in the east. Uh, and so they started using their long ships to explore into Russia using a lot of the rivers. Uh, and so uh, the people in, I think, in Russia called them the Rus or Rus uh, was the common name. Uh, although I think the other term they used uh, was Varangian uh, as well. I think they say the term Rus or Rus is more of a Greek term uh, that was used. Uh, and a lot of the Vikings, if you look at this image uh, right here, I've got um, kind of blow this up right here. But a lot of them uh, you can see from the Baltic Sea, you know, close to where Scandinavia is, uh, they used a lot of the rivers of like where Ukraine and Russia is to eventually try to reach uh, into parts of Russia and then down into the Black Sea because uh, they were trying to link up with the Byzantine Empire, uh, which was down there uh, in uh, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe. Uh, and um, they were up to trade with them and all, the, I guess, the Asian Oriental trade that was coming uh, from the East. And so uh, they were trying to go down rivers like the Don, the Dnieper, uh, the Volga, uh, the Neem, and other, and other rivers that are kind of in that part of the world uh, at the time. So you can see the Vikings kind of come into that part of Russia uh, between the 9th uh, in, in the 10th centuries. Uh, and uh, over time, 
uh, they would eventually create a state there uh, sometime around the ninth century that was later referred to as the Kievan Rus, is what they usually called it. Uh, and it was based around several cities, uh, one Kiev or Kiev, as they called it, uh, which is now the capital of the Ukraine. Uh, there was also Novgorod, which was up in the uh, kind of northwestern part of Russia uh, as well. You can see both those cities, like Novgorod is closer to the Baltic Sea uh, in that map. And then uh, Kiev, uh, Kiev uh, of course, located closer to like where the Dnieper River is uh, in now the modern Ukraine uh, today. So you got the Vikings coming in, uh, and uh, the people, uh, the Slavs that were, I think, already there uh, referred to them as the Rus uh, because the fact that they ro rode Viking ships, the so-called long ships. Uh, in fact, the word Rus supposedly came from the term to row, like to row a ship. Uh, and um, they have a lot of early rulers that first came in, but the one they usually talk about the most that's pretty important is Prince Rurik. Uh, he's considered to be really uh, the first leader uh, of, of the Rurik dynasty uh, that will be founded afterwards, which reigned over early Russia, starting in the 9th century and up through the Middle Ages. I think the Rurik dynasty goes up to like 1598. Uh, and he was known as the Grand Prince of Kiev. He was called Grand Prince of Novgorod. Uh, and um, he was really considered to be you know, one of their first great leaders that they have uh, in Russia. And a lot of the early, like I said, leaders of Russia were descended back to the Vikings uh, and all that. Uh, there were other uh, leaders later, uh, like um, he also had a brother uh, that was named Oleg, Oleg of Novgorod, uh, that also ruled uh, as well right after him. He died. Uh, also, a few others you can see uh, that were kind of famous later in early Russian history were. Askold and Durr. There was actually an early female ruler they had uh, who was named Olga of Kiev uh, as well. Uh, but uh, they always talk about this other leader that was really the one that they think kind of is considered one of their first great leaders that they have uh, in early Russia uh, of the Kievan, you know, Russian state. Uh, and uh, that's St. Vladimir or Vladimir the First or usually Vladimir the Great is what they call him in Russia, uh, who lived between the, the, the 10th and the 11th centuries. He was actually a uh, grandson of, Ole, of o Olga of Kiev. Uh, and um, he's important because uh, they think that Vladimir uh, was the one uh, that began to convert Russia to Christianity because they think that the early Vikings that came in brought in paganism, like they had pagan religions. Yes, worshiping like the old pagan Viking gods uh, and all that. Uh, and so he's the one that put them on a footing to becoming a Christian nation later. Uh, and uh, they looked around at different religions. You know, uh, they actually sent out people to figure out like what religion they wanted to adopt and all that. And I think they looked at the Catholic faith and other religions. Uh, and they eventually chose the Orthodox faith, Orthodox Christianity, sometimes called Eastern Orthodox or Greek Orthodox. Uh, and uh, that was because of the influence of the Byzantine Empire uh, to the south, you know, in the, in the Black Sea. Uh, and so uh, that, that was definitely seen as a major influence in turning, turning around, you know, Russian history at that point. Uh, yeah, the Byzantine Empire, you know, based at Constantinople, didn't just influence them by religion. Though. Like a lot of the architecture in early, like Russia and all that, up to early modern times, uh, was influenced by them. Like, see all the onion domes, like, say, at St. Basil's Cathedral. Uh, that was from, you know, pretty much uh, Byzantine influences. Uh, the language, the Russian language, was influenced from Greek. Uh, so Cyrillic you know, in Russia uh, was kind of derived from from Greek over time. And so Russia Russia eventually is going to be seen, uh, if you study about Russian history, it, a lot of the Russians kind of view uh, Moscow, when Moscow becomes you know more important over time, uh, as this so-called third row, uh, like a successor uh, to the Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire, uh, all that. Because you have Rome and Constantinople, and they kind of view it as that, you know, uh, in the in in the future, so that's why Vladimir the Great is important. Uh, he died just recently, 
looks like 1,007 years ago. So I think just recently uh, was a 1,000 year anniversary of his death. Now, I'll also talk about something else that happened, of course, in Russia that was kind of turbulent, uh, if you know about this. Uh, and what happened was in the 13th century, uh, medieval Russia got invaded by the Mongols. The Mongols who came out of Mongolia uh, formed the Mongol Empire, uh, which was created by Genghis Khan, uh, who uh, was also known as Temujin. Uh, Temujin, yeah, Temujin. Uh, and um, his empire... Uh, would roll up and conquer great, great, you know, regions of Eurasia. I'll kind of show you a map of of what uh, it looked like. But uh, his empire, you know, started, they think, in the early 1200s, early 13th century, uh, and began to uh, push eastward, like into like taking over China. Uh, they took over Korea. Uh, they pushed into Western China. You can see they pushed through all the way to like the Persian Gulf conquering like Iran, uh, Iraq, like if you know about it, the Mongols sacked Baghdad. Uh, and uh, then you can see they even pushed into uh, Russia at one point and took over that uh, as well. I think there's even some theories that the, the Mongols got all the way to like Ukraine and Poland. Uh, so that far westward, uh, even maybe close to where Hungary is. So they were pushing all the way that west uh, at one point. Uh, and uh, what happened later was the Mongols, after the death of Genghis Khan, his, his sons and grandsons eventually broke it up into different, what they call khanates, uh, which were uh, areas that were ruled by the Mongols uh, and all, all their uh, allies, like the so-called Tatars or Turkish peoples that they kind of used as mercenaries uh, to control all these vast areas. Uh, and you see the area that's in that Russian uh area which is the Khanate of the Golden Horde. Uh, that was an area which was created uh, by one of uh, Genghis Khan's grandsons, uh, which is Batu Khan. He, he's one that created the so-called Golden Horde Khanate. And this became this kind of like vassal state of the Mongols uh, that was actually uh, run by the Tatars, which were Turkish peoples that were kind of mercenaries, I told you, under, under the Mongols. And um, the term Golden Horde uh, supposedly originated from the fact that the Tatars would live in these uh, tents that had kind of a golden color to it. And so they, they called it that as a nickname, Golden Horde. Uh, and, uh, and I think also, if you know about the Russians, were forced to basically be vassals to them. They had to pay, pay them gold tribute or they would get their cities attacked and killed. Because uh, I think the Mongols, when they came in, they wiped out half of Russia. They they pretty much killed a lot of people. I think I think consider the whole Mongol invasion of Eurasia one of the most catastrophic things that ever happened in, in world history. Because it led to I forget how many people died in history, but it was many million. Uh, and um, anyway, apparently there was a deal where Kiev, Kiev, or what they call it in Ukraine today. Uh, they refused to pay uh, the Mongols and ba Batu Khan. And so Mongols went and they laid siege uh, to, to the city, city uh, in 1240. They burned it down. They destroyed it uh, and uh, wiped it out. And uh, that's why uh, later, if you study about, you know, Moscow, that's why Moscow becomes more important. Uh, after, after, I guess, the 13th century, because Kiev declined and Moscow rose in, in more prominence uh, afterwards. So kind of kind of talking about, uh, you know, what happened to, you know, when the Mongols came in, which was really a turbulent period, you know, in Russian period. And, you know, and um, it's going to take them several hundred years. I want to say 300 years or more uh, to actually push the Mongols out and all that. But uh, in Russia, they still have a lot of people that are, Related to the Mongols and the Tatars, you know, and all that. Now, I'm going to talk also next about uh, some of these other famous Russian rulers that came to power. Which one of the most famous that 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 came to power around the 15th century at the end of the Middle Ages was Ivan the uh, Third. You see here, it's known as the Great, uh, and he's an important figure uh, in in Russian history. 
Uh, he's important because they think Ivan the Third or Ivan the Great is considered the one that would consolidate all the Russian lands uh, together uh, and free free the Russian people from the Mongols. He starts to really push the Mongols back, starts you know pushing into like Siberia uh, and all of that. Uh, and uh, and by the way, he's going to also start using this new title that a lot of Russian monarchs will, will have later. Uh, which will be uh, the term czar, uh, which it's spelled different ways. Uh, if you know about that in English, uh, use the T or a C. Uh, the word czar is kind of a derived version of the word Caesar, uh, which was you know originated from the Byzantine Empire. And I think he ended up marrying one of one of the last Byzantine emperors' like nieces, uh, and so uh, he decided to kind of. Uh, Kind of stylize himself as almost like a like a Roman version of of like a Russian emperor, you know that kind of thing. Uh, and so he, later, if, if you know what happens, he proclaims Russia as like a third Rome, like with Moscow uh, as its main capital. Uh, and um, he does a lot of things that's very famous. Uh, he's famous for if you know about it, he actually is the one that starts to renovate the Kremlin. You start using the Kremlin to rule from uh, the Russian rulers. Uh, he starts adopting the double-headed eagle, which they think uh, was something that originated going back to Roman times with the Romans and the Byzantine Empire. And of course, like I said, he unofficially called himself a czar, but it wasn't official. So he's not really considered the first czar of Russia officially because it wasn't really something he was coordinated with. Uh, and all that, but Ivan the Fourth is is I think his grandson will later be seen as the one that really, of course, uh, does does that. Uh, he is the second longest, by the way, reigning Russian ruler. Uh, Forty three years uh, he was in power. Uh, I think it was fourteen sixty two to fifteen oh five. And the only thing that tops that is Ivan the Terrible. Ivan the Fourth, his grandson, who reigned the longest, uh, fifty four around fifty four years. Uh, overall, uh, here's some images. Of course, um, that's of course modern Moscow uh, that you're looking at right there. Uh, so yeah, Moscow starts eventually to become the you know the capital of Russia uh, at that point. Later, they do switch to Saint Petersburg. If you know about that, uh, under under Peter the Great. Uh, but on the left, you see the Kremlin. Uh, that's where basically a lot of rulers, monarchs, now the president of Russia, and all that reigns from. Uh, you know, rules from. Uh, overall, St. Basil's Cathedral, of course, on the right. That's Red Square, of course, you're looking at. A lot of these buildings were built over time, uh, you know, uh, in modern Russia today. Uh, that's the Grand Kremlin Palace you see uh, up there with the green roof on it. That's kind of like the uh, Russian version of the White House. That's where Vladimir Putin, uh, Putin the, the you know Russian president, rules from right there. Here's another image of it, of course, the Grand yeah Grand Kremlin Palace, of course, uh, overall. Now, I'm going to get next into talking about the Russian monarchs. We're going to you know, discuss you know, the different czars that, that take over Russia, uh, which uh, I'll kind of get to the main ones. I'll talk about a few other ones I'll kind of mention about later as well. But those are probably the ones I'll talk about the most. Ivan IV, uh, known as the Terrible, Peter the Great, uh, Catherine the Great. I guess I'll mention later uh, Emperor Alexander the First uh, as well. I'll probably talk more about him later when we get closer to the, the 19th century uh, and all that. But the one I'll talk about first uh, right here uh, is Ivan the Terrible. Uh, I told you he was the grandson of Ivan the Great or Ivan the Third. Uh, if you know about him, he's considered to be the first official czar of Russia, which he would be coronated with the actual title uh, in 1547. Uh, they do think he was one of the most absolute uh, of the Russian monarchs, kind of reigned with an iron fist. Uh, like I think I almost compare him sometimes with Joseph Stalin as a czar. Uh, and uh, if you can see his reign was from 1530 to 1584, of course, in the 16th century. Uh, he is known for a lot of things. Uh, one thing he did uh, he started what they call the Tsardom of Russia, uh, where all the rulers of Russia and the monarchs 
reign with the title czar uh, from 1547 uh, to 1721. And then Peter the Great, starting in 1721, started using the word emperor also as well, because Russia was expanding and getting much, much larger. Uh, and so from 1721 to I guess 1917, really 1917, 1918, really 1917. Um, it should be 1918, really. Um, they use the term emperor uh, also, also as well. Uh, Ivan uh, had different nicknames. Uh, he was, uh, if you know about it, uh, he was called uh, Ivan Grozny, which was uh, a variation in Russian that means, well, we say terrible as a translation, uh, but some people think the translation means uh, something like uh, the fearsome, uh, the formidable, uh, those kind of names. Uh, some people would say um, the awesome, I think was another translation of the actual name. And um, the name itself was kind of like a terms of endearment, but it was also a name that kind of struck fear in a lot of his enemies, like the Mongols and all that. Tartars, Tartars, uh, and um, I think there was an old saying about Ivan the Fourth uh, when he was born, uh, like as an infant. Uh, he was born with two teeth, one uh, to devour his own his enemies, and the other tooth to devour uh, his own people, because uh, that's kind of one thing he's kind of known for. Uh, Ivan, Ivan the Fourth, the terrible. I'll kind of show you some images uh, right here, but if you know about Ivan the Terrible, he was the one that constructed uh, St. Basil's Cathedral, uh, which was built, you know, where Red Square is in Moscow. Uh, it's famous for its onion-shaped domes, which they do think was influenced by the Byzantine Empire, Byzantine architecture uh, overall. Uh, it was built in the mid-16th century. They think it was built between 1555 uh, to 1561. Uh, they do think it commemorated uh, his actual uh, uh, military victories over what is called Kazan, uh, which is an area that's, I think it's close to it, we're around Siberia, Western Siberia, I thought, uh, where uh, there was a formal um, Mongol Khanate ruled by the Tatars, uh, and he, he conquered that area. That area, like the area where, uh, I think it's called Cyber, is another area they took over, which is where the name Siberia came from later. Uh, another Khanate area he also conquered as well. And so uh, after, I think he massacred a bunch of them, he built this uh, Orthodox cathedral there uh, in Moscow to honor that whole military victories. And so that's really one of his most famous things he did, like architecturally wise uh, in, in like Moscow today. Uh, the building of St. Basil's Cathedral. So it's very famous for its colorful uh, onion-shaped domes uh, that's on it. Uh, the only thing about uh, Ivan IV, uh, he was known, uh, very notorious for committing a lot of mass genocide against his own people. So yeah, I have, I've kind of talked about the fact that he's kind of sometimes been compared with Joseph Stalin, who you know did a lot of things in Russia to, I guess, kill a lot of people because of his political oppression. He did the same thing. There was a lot of political oppression under uh, Ivan the Terrible, uh, and which included actually one of the first major Russian secret polices that was created, which, you know, Russia is kind of known for having uh, through the many years, not just up through the Soviet times, but probably up to now uh, in the Federation. Uh, and um, it was called the Apricniki. Uh, it was a, basically this uh, special uh, order of, of police that he created, which had, forget how many men were in it, like close to maybe a few thousand. And they were sometimes called the czar's dogs because uh, they would ride around uh, on horses uh, with um, supposedly like a dog's head, I think, on their uniforms. And they would carry brooms with them because they were trying to sweep away any enemies of the state. Uh, and uh, a lot of people were thrown in prison or even, you know, killed by, you know, uh, Ivan's orders and all that. Uh, so uh, it's something that he's kind of known for, notorious for. I think they say it peaked uh, in 1570 because uh, later he disbanded it. You know about that, uh, Peter the, uh, uh, Ivan, the Ivan the Terrible. Uh, and um, 
there was an incident called the Novgorod massacre, which happened up in northwestern part of Russia, close to the Baltic Sea, where maybe close to about 30,000 people were actually massacred by the Aprikniki uh, because of the fact that he thought that they weren't uh, loyal to him. I think it was because of all the conflicts going on at the time in, in northern Europe with like the rise of the Swedish Empire and Poland and Lithuania. I think a lot of people were actually not loyal to him, but Poland and all that. And so uh, he killed a bunch of them and all that. But I think he later regretted it uh, doing this, of course, during his reign. Uh, Ivan, Ivan, by the way, uh, later, uh, we kind of go back here uh, and you know talk about Ivan. Ivan, um, the dynasty later declined, they think, uh, by the time of his death. Um, the Rurik dynasty, I told you, kind of goes up to 1598. Uh, apparently, right before he died uh, in 1581, uh, he uh, killed his main heir, uh, the Tsarevich, which was Ivan Ivanovich. Um, uh, Ivan, uh, apparently, uh, there was some kind of quarrel between uh, his father, Ivan the Terrible, and uh, his wife, Ivan's wife, Ivan Ivanovich's wife. Uh, and um, struck him with his staff. You kind of see he's kind of holding in his left hand there, killed his own son. Uh, and so I think afterwards there were some other rulers that kind of reigned after he died, but they weren't any good. Uh, and so basically the Rurik dynasty declined afterwards, and Russia went through a turbulent period uh, where the state kind of went through a lot of problems. And that's the next thing I'm going to get to uh, and talk about a little bit today. Uh, but of course, get to the uh, rise of the, we'll talk about the Romanov dynasty a little bit uh, in a second. But Russia kind of goes through this very turbulent period uh, for a bunch of years uh, that's called the so called time of troubles, which went, went around for like about maybe 15 years uh, from 1598 to 1613. And so there was a period of anarchy. Uh, throughout Russia. Uh, there was no major czars that were real big in power. I think maybe even one I'll kind of mention about well, that was kind of uh, interesting. Uh, but the Rurik dynasty was kind of collapsing at that point. Uh, and um, I think they even had like a bunch of plagues breaking out in Russia, which kind of compounded things on top of that. And, uh, they had one czar they had, they had that was maybe you may have heard of called Boris Gudinov that kind of reigned uh, for about maybe seven years from 1598 to 1605. And he was one of the very few uh, non Rurik czars that had reigned at that time. Uh, he, I think, had been an advisor to uh, the actual, I think, under, I want to say, going back to Ivan, Ivan uh, the fourth. And I think Ivan had a son named Theodore uh, that reigned briefly because uh, he was the regent of him. But um, after Fyodorta died, uh, they kind of, they couldn't figure out what to do exactly. And so the boyars all met uh, to elect a new czar to put in power uh, at that point. And so the, the, the czar they brought up was, of course, a man you may have heard of named Michael Romanov, uh, which started the so-called Romanov dynasty. Uh, which would start in 1613 and continue to really, yeah, 1970, I think is when it actually ended. Uh, and um, anyway, um, uh, the boyars um, had this, uh, they had like their, their own like um, assembly they had. I think it's called the Assembly of the Boyars in Russia. And so they elected Michael the first, Michael Romanov, who, by the way, was related to uh, one of Ivan the Fourth's through uh, his wife. I think it was like I want to say a grand nephew of uh, Anastasia Romanova uh, was her name, and that's how he was descended. I here it is right here. Uh, actually, the seventh wife. I think Ivan had like some like seven wives at one point, and so that's how he was descended that far back. They had to go to find somebody. Uh, of course, what's going to happen if you know about it? They'll start using the double-headed eagle, the Romanov dynasty, also as well. Uh, and so, the Romanovs are going to have all these, you know, great monarchs that'll come in power later. And uh, really, the first one really wasn't that famous. Uh, the one they think that was more, I guess, well known. You see in that image there is Alexis or Alexia the uh, first. They called him. 
uh, who uh, reigned from uh, 1645 to 1676. Uh, he actually was considered the actual first Romanov czar that really put Russia on the footing to being an absolutist state. Because uh, under him, the um, Russian nobility, which is called the boyars, were weakened. Uh, in fact, he actually, I told you about that assembly of nobil assembly of nobles that the boyars had. He actually closed it down, abolished it, uh, and all of that. And so after that, he began to gain power politically in the state uh, over the boyars. Uh, and then he also even gained power and took over the Orthodox Church uh, also uh, as well. So he's kind of considered one that's kind of an important figure. Uh, he's also got a lot of relatives that that reign later as czars. I think he has one. I thought he had a few czars, another czar named, I think it was Theodore. Wasn't there one named Theodore and a few other czars? But uh, the main ones that <clears throat> become um, later his actual children that are kind of famous is like, yeah, these are all the sons he has. Yeah, Theodore the Third, I think, is the main one he had that reigned early on. Uh, and then Ivan the Fifth uh, was another one he had, of course. And then the most famous real czar of Russia later, that uh, was one of his sons, was Peter the Great, uh, reigned from 1682 uh, to 1725. So, yeah, I'll, I'll probably spend more of my time uh, talking about, uh, you know, uh, Peter the Great. I did want to talk about one thing, though, about the nobility. Uh, they were a minority uh, in Russia because you know about Russia. Russia was prim primarily a state that was comprised of peasants, which a lot of them were eventually serfs, uh, which serfs are basically peasants that are kind of bound to the land, bound to the land, uh, which are usually not free. Uh, you know that. And so the nobility itself only made up like 1% to 2% of the actual Russian population. So that amount of people had that much control uh, over all of Russia. You can understand why they had the Russian Revolution later. Uh, so they might have had maybe almost 2 million people that were actually in, you know, uh, the nobility. They probably had a middle class, but it was very small. Uh, so most people were either in the nobility or they were in uh, the lower classes. Now I'm going to get into and talk about Peter the Great. Uh, Peter the Great, of course, uh, considered to be one of the greatest monarchs, of course, uh, of, of the Russian Empire. Uh, and um, Peter the Great, uh, like I said, reigned from, really goes back to 1682, because uh, he would share power uh, with his brother, his, his actual half-brother, which is Ivan V. Uh, Peter the Great, the reason why he's, considered important ruler of the Russian Empire is the fact that he would take the state of Russia, which was probably still kind of considered medieval uh, at that time, and he would try to convert it into a modernized state, uh, try to make it, you know, on a footing with a lot of the er other, you know, major European powers that are in the West. Uh, and so Peter the Great, he wanted to make Russia like all the other European powers. He didn't want people to be like an Asian power, but a European one. Uh, pretty much. Uh, but it wasn't like that, you know, early on. Uh, he struggled up uh, to, because he had to rule with his half-brother, Ivan V, who uh, apparently had, I think he was mentally handicapped. Uh, and so they had, they kind of shared power uh, with each other. Uh, and then he had this half-sister named Sofia Alexievna, uh, and uh, she was actually the regent behind the actual throne of the, of the two brothers. Uh, Ivan V and Peter, and for about seven years, she controlled the throne uh, before eventually they got rid of her. They, I think they put her in a convent, uh, and from there, Peter and his brother kind of reigned together, I think until, I want to say 1696, and then when Ivan V died, Peter then took over sole rule uh, over Russia. I uh, kind of show kind of expansion here, but yeah, some of the things that Peter's kind of known for, he has westernization of Russia. Uh, it's one of the big things he's known for. Uh, Peter does have this thing that he does, uh, 1697 to 98. Uh, he uh, has this so-called grand embassy where he goes on this tour of Western Europe, where he would go to different states uh, in the West to study about the West. 
Uh, he also wanted to get military help to fight the Ottoman Empire, who he saw as one of Russia's big enemies. Uh, and so he went to Poland, Lithuania. He went to the Netherlands. Uh, he went, I think at one point, he went to England. He went to uh, the Habsburg monarchy in Austria. I think later he went to France too as well, but not this time. And so he wants to learn a lot about the West. He wants to learn about military stuff. He wants to learn how to build a Navy and things like that. And so these are all things that he's going to do, uh, Peter the Great, to modernize, you know, the state. And I'll kind of talk about some things that he did to uh, reform the state after he came back, because I think the embassy uh, last one, I think, was 1697 to 98. He's the first Russian ruler uh, to actually travel to the West. <clears throat> and um, these are some reforms that he did that were famous. Uh, he got all the people in Russia, especially the nobility, to begin start dressing <clears throat> like the West, like westernized dress uh, in general. Also, the men, that's one thing that's famous you know, about Peter the Great, was he made them cut off all their beards. They maybe could have a mustache or something like he had, uh, but they literally had to shave uh, their beards off. Uh, if you didn't pay like a beard tax, which you could, that's the only way you keep your beard if you pay a tax for it. And um, men literally had to carry a, a beard token with them that said they paid the tax. If you didn't have the token, they would shave your beard off, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, they do think he introduced the potato uh, to Russia as well, uh, which helped to expand agriculture uh, throughout Russia. But one thing that Peter is very, very famous for, <clears throat> he increased serfdom, which they already had in Russia, but he made it even more. And uh, the Russians will have serfdom in, until pretty much the mid-19th century. Uh, he introduced the Julian calendar, one of the first leap calendars uh, into Russian history uh, as well to transform their calendar and all that uh, as well. And he also introduced things like arts and culture uh, to Russia uh, as well. Uh, politically, he founded this thing called the Collegium. I don't know if you ever heard of that, but it was this kind of uh, Russian departmental uh, system for, for government, uh, which divided up uh, Russian government into different departments of ministry, kind of like they have in Russia today uh, in other states. He was really the first to do that in Russia. And so they had different affairs for different things. So foreign affairs, they had, they had a you know department for war. Uh, they had a department for commerce, uh, the justice, the, the Navy and trade and other things like that. So uh, that was something that he did uh, that was very, very famous, uh, the Collegium. But really the thing, I guess, that he might be more famous for, like for modernizing Russia, is their military. Uh, you know, before him, they still kind of had this military that was maybe more medieval uh, in form. And so uh, he brought in, you know, Western advisors, uh, you know, Westernized, you know, weaponry, things like that, uh, to try to create a more modernized, you know, Russian army. And then the other thing he's known for, of course, today is that he founded the Russian Navy, which they think was founded in 1796. So that's something he's also well known for, also as well, Peter the Great. And that's something we're going to get to and talk about, because, you know, Peter had gone to the West. He wanted to get military aid uh, to fight, you know, uh, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, he's going to, you know, kind of form like, I think it's the Holy League, I think they call it the time, uh, where uh, they try to align with the Habsburg monarchy, uh, Poland, Lithuania, uh, which are all Christian type nations uh, in Europe. Uh, and so uh, he's going to try to, uh, you know, one of the things that Peter Great wanted to really do uh, was to try to find warm seaports uh, that Russia uh, could trade uh, with other states. Uh, to expand their, their economy. Uh, and so he saw this like in two places, the Black Sea, like the northern coast of the Black Sea, like around the Crimea, uh, and then also the Baltic Sea. Uh, he does try this, of course, if you know about this, in the Great Turkish War, uh, which was taking place from 1683-1699 uh, in Europe, where, remember, Russia, I think Poland, Lithuania, uh, Habsburg Monarchy, and the Holy Roman Empire uh, was fighting the Ottoman Empire, uh, who 
had control of parts of Eastern Europe, like around where Hungary and Transylvania uh, is and all that. And so he wants to push them out of the Black Sea. Uh, and so that's why Peter the Great built the, built the Russian Navy uh, to do that. And uh, his greatest feat, at least in the northern Black Sea, was the seizure of Azov, uh, which uh, is located on the northern coast of the Black Sea, uh, which he took in the so-called Azov campaign you may have heard of. Uh, and it's really his first success there. But really, uh, the uh, Russians don't really take like the Crimean area, like the Crimean Peninsula and all that, until Catherine the Great comes in. So that'll be a little later uh, when that occurs. Now, uh, Peter had this enemy uh, that I'll kind of talk about on the right, uh, who was uh, Charles the Twelfth of Sweden. I think the Swedes called him Carl, uh, if you know that. Uh, and um, it led to a war uh, between Russia and the Swedish Empire, uh, which was called the Great Northern War. It was one of these several of these northern wars that broke out in Europe uh, that went back. I think I want to say going back all the way to like the 16th century. They were fighting. Because of Sweden, if you know about it, it come down uh, from above the Baltic Sea, and they attacked Poland. They also seized part of the, where the Baltic states are today. I think the Poles call it the Deluge in the 16th century. They start coming in and taking over Poland. Uh, and um, around this time is the peak of the Swedish Empire, which uh, they think the peak ruler of it was a ruler named uh, King Charles the Twelve. 12th, who was a very young, young man uh, when he was king. Uh, and he was kind of seen as a military genius. Uh, and uh, eventually uh, the two got in a big war uh, with each other. And um, kind of see here, at one point, uh, he, he there, of course, you can see there's the Swedish Empire in that image there. You can see all the territory that they controlled at one point. So they controlled uh, part of like... Um, pretty much Sweden and uh, Finland and those areas right there. Uh, also controlled parts of the Baltic Sea and part of Poland uh, as well. I think I want to say part of the northern part of Poland may be controlled by them at one point. I guess between the 18th and 19th century, that's maybe the peak of Sweden and, and Swedish history that you have. But uh, Sweden under uh, Charles XII at one point invaded Poland, uh, like in the central part of Poland. And he also invaded into uh, now what is, I guess, close to where the Belarus is, Western Russia, uh, and in the Ukraine. Uh, and uh, to combat uh, the Swedish forces, one of the things that the Russians did, we know about it, was they used scorched earth policies against the Swedes, uh, where they like burned their crops uh, and prevented them from getting any kind of vital stuff that they would need uh, to to be able to march their forces through there. Uh, and uh, it led to a pivotal battle in Poltava, which is now in the Ukraine. By the way, eastern part of Ukraine is where it's located today. And uh, the uh, Russian forces under uh, Peter the Great crushed crushed the Swedish force there. Uh, July of 1709, uh, the Swedes had a small army of like maybe 30,000 troops. But Peter the Great's forces had 70-something thousand troops. And uh, they actually crushed like and captured like something like, I want to say one-third of, of Charles XII's army uh, was wiped out. Uh, and a bunch of their generals were actually captured after battle. And so it was considered a humiliating defeat uh, to, to Sweden. And the Swedish Empire never really recovered from it, uh, from that whole thing. And so uh, that actually caused the decline of the Swedish Empire after that war. But the the great the Great Northern War uh, is considered to be a really important war uh, in early the early you know, Russian Empire because uh, it's really considered the first major uh, European war that Russia really gets involved in. Uh, and then afterwards, Peter the Great starts to become a major 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 player, you know, in world affairs uh, afterwards. Uh, now, one of the things that Peter's going to do because of, you know, victories in, you know, the whole of uh, that war uh, is, of course, Peter's going to start building, you know, St. Petersburg, which he starts doing and founds it in 1712. And so afterwards, he's going to make that into the so-called Russian capital, you know, uh, of, of, of Russia from 1712 
uh, the 1918. Uh, St. Petersburg, if you know about it, is the second largest city in Russia. Uh, population about 5.4 million. It's about how many people uh, live there. Uh, Moscow is the largest populated city. Uh, I think it's maybe close to 12 million people live there, or at least in the metropolitan area, I guess, uh, in Moscow. Uh, but St. Petersburg for a while was considered, you know, the center of Russia, you know, before later, I guess the Soviet period that comes in after the Russian Revolution. There's kind of an image, of course, of like the modern city of, of St. Petersburg uh, in the distance right there, which is not close to where the uh, the Gulf of Finland is. It's kind of in the eastern part of the Baltic Sea is the location of where St. Petersburg uh, was built. It was, by the way, named after St. Peter, not after Peter the Great himself, if you're <laughs> wondering about that. Um, of course, Peter would go on to build uh, different um, you know, palaces there. He had, The main thing he built, of course, was uh, the Peterhof uh, or Peterhof Palace, uh, which was a type of Baroque-style palace, uh, which became his main court. I think Peterhof means Peter's court, basically. And a lot of Russians kind of view it as the so-called Russian Versailles. Uh, and, uh, and so obviously the, the, the Russians were kind of trying to copy monarchs like Louis XIV who were building similar lavish type palaces uh, throughout Western Europe at the time. Here's other images. It's very famous for its fountain, water fountains, which I think are close to 300 years old. Uh, you know, if you study about that before, about the fountains that are there. Um, there's kind of a wider image of it. And so it includes like, you know, parks and gardens, like other, other palaces that were built uh, at, the, at the time. Uh, by the way, uh, Peter, Peter uh, wants to envision, if you study about, you know, uh, St. Petersburg, he wants it to be like a westernized city. So that's kind of why he built St. Petersburg, because Moscow was kind of seen as being more medieval. I guess, in origins uh, at the time. And he, so he, he wants this so-called westernized city uh, to be able to trade with the West, uh, you know, it's warm seaport with the West uh, he could use. And he called it the window on the West was the common quote that he kind of gave for, for what St. Petersburg uh, would become, of course, later. So I'm going to kind of move on. I'm going to, you know, here's some other images right here kind of showing like it's kind of an outlet there, a little canal that goes out to the Gulf of Finland, you can see there. Uh, also, oh, he built that too. Uh, that's the um, Peter and Paul Fortress, which was a citadel uh, that was built in St. Petersburg. Uh, suppose he built that to defend the city in case it got attacked again by the Swedes. Uh, but it's a very interesting citadel. Uh, it was used for different things. Uh, I think they built a church there, like an Orthodox cathedral was built there. Uh, but it was later used as a political prison, by the way, uh, by the Russian czars and even by the Bolsheviks uh, later when they took over Russia. Uh, there's a statue of Peter the Great. It was actually put St. Petersburg um, later by Catherine the Great. So it's kind of an equestrian statue you're kind of looking at with that. Uh, let me talk about some later czars that they had. Uh, after Peter the Great died, uh, his wife took over. You see there in the middle on the left, which was Catherine the I. Uh, she was the first female ruler uh, of, of the Russian Empire. She was, of course, empress empress uh, of Russia. Peter the Great was the first emperor, uh, you know. Uh, in fact, I uh, kind of have a list here of rulers, but uh, after Peter founded the Russian Empire in 1721, uh, they would they would actually have overall 14 rulers, 10 emperors, and they had four empresses uh, that would reign uh, over Russia uh, at one point. I think in that list there's one missing, which was Ivan the Sixth. Some people don't include him uh, sometimes, uh, but Ivan VI was a co cousin of Empress Elizabeth, who reigned briefly but, but was deposed by her. But yeah, Peter II was the grand grandson of Peter the Great. Uh, Anna uh, was a uh, daughter of Ivan V, who reigned briefly for about a decade. And then they had Elizabeth, who came in, uh, who was probably considered the most famous ruler that reigned after Peter the Great died. Uh, a little bit about her on the left. 
Uh, she was the youngest daughter of Peter the Great. Uh, she didn't have any heirs, which was kind of a problem. So they, I think they consider uh, Empress Elizabeth to be the last direct descendant uh, of the actual Romanov dynasty. Because uh, from there, it's kind of a mix of Russian and German blood, uh, if you know about that issue. Uh, and uh, Elizabeth, by the way, was kind of like Peter the Great. Uh, she continued a lot of reforms in Russia. Uh, she was considered an enlightened despot. Most people don't know that about her because uh, people think of Catherine the Great and all that. But she's the one that founded the University of Moscow, uh, which is, you know, famous, prestigious, you know, well, probably one of the most prestigious uh, universities in Russia today. Uh, began the construction of the Winter Palace, uh, the St. Petersburg. Uh, so she was also known for that. Uh, but uh, on the right, uh, that is uh, her nephew, uh, later uh, Emperor Peter III. Uh, he was actually mostly German, uh, and he would inherit the throne afterwards, and he would take over. But he was, I'll get to it later, kind of controversial. He, of course, was the husband of Catherine the Great, who we're going to talk about mostly today. Uh, Catherine, uh, who came in uh, later afterwards, um, she, of course, was considered really the most famous female ruler of Russia, definitely their greatest probably one of the top two greatest monarchs of the Romanov dynasty, Pure and pretty much Pierre the Great were the two most famous ones. And um, Catherine would continue a lot of the reforms and westernization that Pierre the Great and Empress Elizabeth were, were trying to do in Russia uh, in, in the 18th century. Uh, and um, kind of talk about her origins, but Catherine was not, she was kind of somewhat a little bit Russian. She had some Russian blood in her. But if you know about it, she was predominantly German. Uh, in fact, she was from these states that was called anhalt Zerbes, which is in northern Germany. And her real name was actually Sophia Augusta. Uh, and um, she actually married uh, Charles Peter Ulrich, uh, who was her cousin. Uh, who was the ruler of Holstein, which was a German state uh, in northern Germany. And he later would go on to become Peter III. Uh, and so apparently he was brought over to, you know, to Russia because that was, I guess, uh, Empress Elizabeth's close, closest, you know, heir overall. Uh, the only thing about Peter III on the right there was that the Russians didn't like him. He, came, he became czar in 1762, uh, when Elizabeth died. <clears throat> and um, apparently the reason why they didn't like him was because he was too German or too pro-German. Uh, in fact, Peter III loved, he loved Frederick the Great. He idolized him, uh, even wanted his soldiers to dress like, he wanted the Russian soldiers to dress like Prussian soldiers and things like that. And so a lot of people thought he was unstable. Uh, they thought he was maybe insane possibly. Uh, and so uh, what ended up happening was Catherine the Great took power uh, through some type of palace coup uh, where she conspired with the Russian military uh, to overthrow Peter. And that's how she came to power. So basically, Catherine the Great uh, overthrew her husband. Later, they think, had him killed uh, to solidify uh, her power uh, over the state. Now, I'm going to talk about some things about Catherine the Great, of course, history-wise a little bit. Now, they do call the period that she reigns, it's often referred to as the Katharina era. Uh, it's kind of like a golden age uh, in Russian history where Russia kind of continues, like I said, uh, the whole westernized reforms, uh, which were heavily influenced by uh, the Enlightenment. I'll kind of talk about what were some reforms that he, she tried to do uh, that are interesting. Uh, one thing she did was she promoted a lot of Western learning. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, the French were a big influence uh, in Western Europe at the time. And so she, she she tried to bring in a lot of like Westernized, like literature, uh, art, and things like that. Uh, they took a lot of books, like from the West. They began translating into Russian. Uh, in fact, uh, Catherine was very close friends with Denis Diderot, uh, who 
was a French philosopher you may have heard of that was known for being one of the editors of the French Encyclopedia. Uh, and at one point bought up his entire library and brought it to Russia. Uh, and so I think it was a deal even where Dennis Diderot came to Russia uh, in the 1770s and visited with uh, her. I think Voltaire talked a lot about uh, Catherine the Great being a great ruler and tried to encourage her to make a lot of changes and reforms uh, to her state. Uh, she also was trying to, you know, educate the nobility. He wanted the nobility, like men and women, uh, to become educated on things like that. And that's something that she, she tries to promote, you know, uh, throughout throughout the country of Russia uh, at the time. I'll kind of talk about some things that she did uh, that are famous, but one of the biggest things that she's known for uh, famous-wise is, I guess, the most famous thing today uh, in Russia is the so-called State Hermitage Museum uh, that was built as part of the Winter Palace, uh, which was founded in the 1760s. Uh, that's something that she helped to create uh, in Russia. That's very famous now throughout the world. Uh, it is considered one of the largest museums uh, you know, in the world, which over 3 million works of art. Uh, a lot of these works of art are modernized art, but some of the art goes back to ancient times. Like they've got Roman art, Roman, you know, art and things like that in it. Uh, historical artifacts, I think Egyptian, probably Greco-Roman, Egyptian and things like that that they've got uh, in their museum. Uh, and um, it was all constructed as part of the Winter Palace uh, that was built uh, at, at the top. Uh, she's also known for like trying to educate girls. Uh, if you know about this, she built this school there called the Smolny Institute uh, that was founded in 1764. Uh, but it did include like the lower classes. That's the only thing about that. So obviously your peasants uh, weren't being educated in you know, compulsory type education like you might see in the rest of Europe that they started to do around the 18th century. But that's something that she was very famous for. Uh, she also founded uh, the so-called Moscow Orphanage uh, in 1763, which is, that was the building for it uh, right there. Uh, but it was later, I think, closed down by the Bolsheviks uh, when they took over after the Russian Revolution. Now, the only thing about um, Catherine the Great's reign was she wanted she had wanted to uh, get rid of serfdom. She was hoping to abolish it. Uh, and all that, and that's, if you know about uh, Catherine the Great, that's really considered to be one of her worst failures, uh, may, maybe as a monarch from her, you know, ideas of her enlightened reforms that she wanted to try to change Russia, because I think she was hoping to make Russia this utopia, you know, that would be like this enlightened state and things like that. Uh, however, a lot of the nobility did not really want to abolish serfdom because it was kind of important to, you know, to their agriculture uh, in general. And so in 1773, they had this rebellion breakout that was very famous early on in her reign, uh, which was called the Pugachev Rebellion, uh, sometimes called a revolt. Uh, and uh, anyway, a little bit about Pugachev. Pugachev was this um, Cossack soldier. Cossack soldiers were uh, these Russian soldiers that were, I think, mostly living predominantly in U Ukraine. I think a lot of them were Ukrainian. Uh, and... Um, Pukachev did not like, he thought, I guess the reforms weren't coming fast enough. Uh, he thought that maybe serfdom ought to be abolished and the land given to the people. Uh, and so in parts of Western Russia, the Ukraine, and I think close to, like, I want to say the Volga region, uh, people began to rebel against uh, Catherine, Catherine the Great's authority. And um, Pukachev actually set up his own separate government. Uh, from Catherine the Great's, uh, and he actually claimed to be Peter the Third, who was dead. I mean, the bizarre that you know that uh, Catherine the Great had over overthrown her husband uh, and all that. And so, uh, in the end, uh, Pugachev uh, they eventually captured him by 1774, uh, and uh, he was eventually executed for it. But the Russian, the Russian army had to go in, literally, and crush the whole thing. They put it down, uh, killing maybe close to 10,000 people. They have been killed. Uh, and uh, But the rebellion ended, and so because of that, you know, basically the reforms that, you know, Catherine had wanted, like to get rid of serfdom, that didn't happen, all that. 
Uh, of course, later, uh, some of the things that, you know, she's really known for that's probably more famous uh, is her expansion uh, of Russia. I'll kind of show you a better map here of Russia here, but Russia starts to expand. It's really considered to be probably one of her greatest, in, uh, you know, successes, I guess, as a ruler uh, was expanding Russia more to the west and more to the east. Uh, these are things she was known for. She would expand Russia and take over a good chunk of Poland. Uh, Poland, Lithuania was a state that was becoming defunct at that point uh, in the 18th century. And so it was partitioned by uh, Russia, Austria, and Prussia. And uh, Russia took almost two thirds of it, close to 60%. Like the eastern part of Poland, or half of it was pretty much taken uh, by her. Uh, she took over parts of like around where the Ukraine is. She seized the Crimea, probably one of her greatest things uh, that she did uh, by the 1780s. Uh, and then they even began to push further toward the Pacific Ocean, Alaska. All that eventually is going to get taken over uh, pretty much under her reign. Yeah, you can see the partition of Poland. Uh, that was something that happened in mid, mid to the late 18th century. But Prussia took a chunk, and so did Austria. And so pretty much Poland wasn't on the map well, again until really, really until after World War I, uh, when it comes back as an actual real state. So, um, and by the way, um, about, about the Russian Empire, uh, by the time, by the time, you know, 19th century approaches uh, and all that, um, the Russian Empire is going to be vast. It's eventually going to grow to like something like nine million square miles, uh, which is, you know, it's still a huge state today. Uh, if you know about the modern Russian Federation, it's one of the largest states, of course, in the world. Uh, and at one point, it was the third largest empire in the world after the British, which was the largest in the, I think, Mongol Empire was the second largest uh, overall. I think the Mongols had the largest continuous empire, I think, at one point, uh, than the Russian one. Uh, there's a lot of legends about uh, Catherine the Great. I don't know if you've heard about this, but they had all these urban legends. She was kind of this flamboyant type ruler uh, that had a lot of lovers, which I forget, there's all kinds of different numbers on that one, 15 to 20, maybe over 20 uh, that she had at one point. And uh, there were stories about her being a nymphomaniac, that she liked sex a lot. Uh, she even had like erotic toys or some kind of erotic cabinet and, that she had or something like that. And um, one of the most famous uh, legends about Catherine the Great uh, was she had sex with like horses, like a stallion. Uh, if you know about that, that's why the image is right there. Uh, if you know, I barely knew Catherine the Great. <laughs> There's a legend that she died uh, making love to a stallion. Uh, they don't think that's a true story about that. Uh, there's another story where she died on the toilet. You know, they had toilets back then, uh, but she died in the bathroom or something like that. And they think that's not true uh, either uh, as well. Uh, now, after her death, they have other rulers uh, that'll reign, of course, later. Uh, you have uh, her, he has a son named Paul. You know, they supposedly, supposedly was uh, actually the son of uh, him. Uh, her and Peter the Third, although it's been disputed about whether that's really true or not. I think there's a theory that there's another theory that maybe uh, Paul the First may have been a son of one of her lovers. So that's an interesting thing about that uh, as well. Uh, he reigned just a few years, and then uh, her grandson, um, of course, Emperor Alexander the First, who I showed earlier, uh, reigned for over twenty something years. Uh, 1801 to 1825, he was later famous for defeating Napoleon when Napoleon invaded Russia in 1812. And he's he's kind of kind of well known uh, in Russian history. I think sometimes they think he's the third most famous uh, monarch of the Romanov dynasty uh, after uh, Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. Uh, the other four czars on the end uh, they have later uh, is Nicholas the uh, First, who uh, was a younger brother of Alexander the First. Uh, you might have heard of him. He's the, uh, the czar when the Crimean War breaks out. Uh, and uh, he's trying to fight the Ottoman Empire, who he uh, calls later uh, the sick old man of Europe uh, and all that. Alexander II later 
uh, was a son of Nicholas the first. Uh, he's going to be famous, Alexander the second. He's uh, known as the Liberator Czar. Uh, he's the one that uh, ends uh, serfdom, all that in Russia. Alexander the third was kind of like a reactionary czar uh, that came in later uh, in the late 19th century. And they had one more czar, the so-called last czar of Russia, you know, uh, which is Nicholas the uh, second. He'll reign until 1917. Uh, but if you know what happens, uh, he eventually ends up getting uh, overthrown. So you've got, got Nicholas II there. We'll talk about later about that. So, so yeah, the Romanov dynasty, they're, they're in power till 1917. Uh, they, they reigned over 300 years. Uh, they were, they were, I would say, out of the different dynasties uh, in Europe. They were the most absolute. I think even up to Nicholas II, he kind of reigned with an iron fist. And that's part of why they ended up getting overthrown, of course, with the Russian Revolution. So, yeah, Russia is known for being ruled uh, by a lot of authoritarian type rulers. You know, later under under the Bolsheviks or communism in Russia, you got, you know, Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin. Uh, those are all kind of rulers that kind of reign uh, that way as well. And I guess today with the modern state of Russia, with the Russian Federation, you've got strong rulers too, uh, like Vladimir Putin as well. Uh, he's kind of almost like that. Uh, in a sense. He's been in power a long time. He's been in power over 20 years uh, in Russia. In fact, he's been in law. When I started teaching, he was in power. And, he's, and I've, I've been teaching for 20 something years. That's how long <laughs> he's been in power. You know, it's, that's crazy about that. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's pretty much it for my lectures, of course, uh, on the age of absolutism. Uh, next week, I'm going to mostly move on to talk about the rise of the British Empire, uh, of course, which really ends up being, you know, the largest empire, uh, you know, uh, in, in the world, um, ends up being more impressive than some of these other empires that are kind of emerging. Uh, so I'll talk about that. But before I go, uh, like I said, don't forget uh, about assignments that I have out. Uh, of course, uh, of course, the, I think the Reformation quiz, I'll check on that. Maybe it has closed. I'm not sure about that, but if you do need it open. I'll kind of reopen that. But I know that the uh, main thing I'll post today, of course, is the first exam. Uh, which is on the age of absolutism, uh, which you will get two attempts on that, but they're averaged out uh, with the grades. You'll see the announcement and the directions on it, all that later. Uh, and then Monday, like I said, I will not have a live lecture. Uh, I'll have like a recorded lecture, which is going to be on the age of enlightenment uh, and um, also the scientific revolution. That'll be like a, uh, I'm going to give like a um, bonus quiz on that, which will kind of go towards, you know, the first exam and all that point. I'll get extra credit for you to do on that because I am going out of town over the weekend. Uh, so I'll kind of be gone for a while, uh, going to a wedding. So I'll see y'all later. Uh, but uh, yeah, like I said, going into week seven, we'll kind of move on to to talk about the British Empire and what what that's famous for as well. So that's it for today. Uh, y'all Y'all take care. Uh, like I said, have a good weekend coming up and I'll see you later. So y'all take care.